is you're going to see scenes from Hamlet, and we will have uh, we'll have also along with those scenes, you're going to hear narration to help sort of like, if you're not that acquainted with the play Hamlet, hopefully the narration will help to tell you what's going on in the story. Um, if you look at the program, which is hugely confusing, um, uh, on top of everything else, I decided to get fancy with my fonts. So if you look at that program, even the program also has, like between scenes, it sort of tells you one or two sentences about what's going to happen in the scene that you're about to see. And then to make it even more confusing, I've decided to interweave in between those Hamlet scenes. You will see some of this original material that people have written in this exploration of Hamlet from their own lives. So, um, uh, I wonder what else do I need to tell you before we start? Uh, I have something. Oh yeah, go ahead. Mask now. reminder, please. Oh, uh, right. Uh, we're going to be performing entirely in masks from the beginning to the end. Oh, I should also, oh, I'm sorry. I do need to tell you that as you well know, we've had times when we've been locked down and also because of sort of the uncertainty of who's going to be able to participate, our class has gone up and down in size over and over. And as a result, we've, we've done a lot of different things. Like on the one hand, you're gonna see multiple Hamlets today. I think everybody in the play plays Hamlet every once in a while. If only in what I call the group speeches. Speeches that are Hamlets, but we've separated them so that we have four or five people expressing Hamlet in that speech. Um, but also, because we needed to perform today, we, uh, we had at a certain point had to say, well, we're gonna do it as a stage reading. So you, people are going to be holding their scripts as, as, as they want. They will be holding up their scripts uh, even as they perform, but you'll be able to hear the emotion through the words nonetheless. I think. This is a poem called Two Prisoners and it's written by Gwendolyn Brooks. I call for you. Cultivation of strength in the dog. Dark bark. In the vertical cold. In the hot paralysis. Under the wolves and coyotes of particular silences. Where it is dry. Where it is dry. I call for you. Cultivation of victory over. Long blows that you want to give and blows you're going to receive. Over. What once? To crumble you down, to sicken you. I call for you. Cultivation of strength to heal and enhance. In the dungeon dark. In the many, many morning dark. In the dark and choke. I am Logan. I am Randy. I am Ian. I am Tom. I am Jeremy. I am David. I am Earl. I am Noah. I am Stephen. I am Mark. I am Michael. I am Brandon. I am Will. I am Mason. I am DJ. I am Ben. I am Akiva. I am Al. I am Dave. And, and I, I am Rabbit. The story so far is that the King of Denmark has just died, and his brother Claudius has assumed the throne and married his widow Gertrude. At night, the castle guards have been getting visitations from a ghost they think might be the ghost of the dead king. They have asked a friend of the king's son, Hamlet, Horatio, to watch with them and identify the ghost. Who's there? Nay, after me, stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king. Bernardo? He. You come most carefully upon your own. Tis now struck twelve. Ye get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. Tis better go. Ooh. And I am sick at heart. Have you had a quiet dog? Not a mouse stern. Well, good, now. If you be Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of our watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Stand hold. Who's there? Friends to this ground. And liegemen to the dame. 
Give you good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier. Who hath relieved you? Bernard has my place. Give you good night. Hola, Bernardo. Say, what is your issue here? A piece of it. <laughs> Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What has this thing appeared again tonight? I have seen nothing. Tush, tush, it will not appear. Sit down a while and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story. What we have not seen. Well, sit me down and let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all, when young Saint Star that was forth from the cold had made his course to loom the part of heaven, where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the brother being one. Wait, peace! Break thee off, where it comes again! In the same figure, like the king that's dead. Thou art a scholar! Speak to it, Horatio! Looks is not like the king. Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder. It will, it will be spoke to. Question it, Horatio. What art thou that usurps this time of night? together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of Denmark did sometimes march. By heaven I charge thee, speak. It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay, speak. I charge thee, speak. Tis gone and will not appear. How now, Horatio? You tremble and look pale. Is not this sometime, something more than fantasy? What think you only? As thou art to thyself, tis strange. In what particular thought to work I know not. But in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption in our state. I'll cross it though it blast me. Stay, illusion. If thou hast any sound or any use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done, that may to thee do ease and grace to me, Speak to me. <laughs> speak of it. Stay and speak. Stop it, Marcellus. It was about to speak. And then it started like a guilty thing upon a fearful summons. Break we our watch up, and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, this spirit dumb to us will speak to him. Do you consent that we shall acquaint him with it, as needful in our loves, fitting our duty? Let's do it. I pray, and this morning know where we shall find him most conveniently. <laughs> the next morning, the court has convened to do some business involving a possible invasion from Norway and other minor issues, and then have a party celebrating the recent wedding of Claudius and Gertrude. Claudius and Gertrude are unhappy with Hamlet because he seems to be taking his father's death too hard. Hamlet thinks the problem is with them and expresses that feeling in his next speech. resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable. It seems to me that all the uses of this world. Fie on fie, toss of the weeded garden that grows to seed, thinks rank and gross in nature, presses it merely. That it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, nor two, so excellent a king that was to this, Hyperion to Satar, so loving to my mother, that he might between the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly, heaven and earth. Must I remember? Oh God, a beast that wants this course of reason? Would have mourned longer, married with my, my uncle, 
My father's brother? But no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, yet ere the salt of most unrighteous tears has less the flushing of her gold eyes, she married! O oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incisions, incisions sheets. It is not, nor cannot come to good. But very my heart, I must not hold my tongue. tongue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In that last speech, Hamlet speaks on his grief over the loss of his father. After reflecting on our own experiences of grief, we've composed the following work from poems down, done by Mears and Helser. This is Rabbit on the Beach of Grief. Fallen down a rabbit hole, created from my own grief. What will I find when I lose myself again? A beach. A thousand yards long lays before me this dawn. Ashamed, hurt, and angry, I shall project myself. Here, I will write my name in the sand. And in an attempt to assemble my broken heart, ever in search of the missing pieces, I shall put down my forty sins in three unspeakable acts. I put down who I am and who I wanted to be, and how I have failed them. I will write the divine name of they whom I served and how I served them ill. Down, down, deeper into the hole. I shall go and stay there in my own hell until finally the tide begins to come. Then I shall sit on this beach and watch as the sea's calm tongue comes to lick away all of me that lays about the sand. And, and be your Lord. So, now, Horatio tells Hamlet about the ghost. Hamlet comes to the watch. There the ghost appears to speak to Hamlet. My hour has almost come, when I, to sulfurous tormenting flame, must render myself Alas, poor ghost. Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So thou art to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? Oh God. Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul, but as best it is. But in the most foul and strange and unnatural, Haste me to know that I, with wings as swift as meditation, or thoughts of love, may sweep to my revenge. Now Hamlet here, tis given out, sleeping in my orchard, a serpent stung me. But know, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life, where's his, or now, where's his crown? Oh, my prophetic soul, my uncle? That I, that incestuous elder, I can't remember. <laughs> Altered. Adulterate. Adulterate beast, one to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. O oh, Hamlet, what a falling off was there from me, whose love was that of dignity, that it went hand in hand, even with the vow I made her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine, but soft. Methinks I sent the morning air. Brief let me be, sleeping within my orchard, upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with juice, cursed of abonia, in a vial, and the porches of my ears did pour the leprous distillment, whose effect holds such a sweet enmity of blood of a man, that, sw that swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body. With sudden vigor it doeth incurred like eagle, e eager droppings into milk, the thin, wholesome blood, so it did mine. Oh, horrible, horrible, most horrible. If thou hast 
nature in thee bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch of luxury and damned incest. <laughs> Fare thee well at once. O oh, all ye host of heaven, O earth, what else remember thee? I, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this, in this distracted globe. In Shakespeare's original work, Hamlet struggles with his relationship, or the lack thereof, with his father. In the following scenes written by myself, Earl Rose, and Tripp, we also explore how our own relationships, or lack thereof, with our fathers. The first piece is called Daddy Pain. Daddy, where are you, Daddy? How come I can't find my daddy? I want to sit on your shoulders and see the whole world. While trying to enjoy the truth of his absence, of what has been, I really don't know what to think. I wanted to let go of all this pain, to keep a grip. Something urged me to push away to be come who I am today. You're a bad daddy. <laughs> How could you leave me? my superman, my comfort, my everything. Maybe it's me that's bad. Maybe it's me that's not good enough. That must be it. I'm not worth sticking around for. I'll show him and everybody else. If I'm bad, I'll be bad. The baddest ever. I asked them, why bother to contemplate them? All that's in my head. Because what I contemplate now are simply thoughts of being a better me. A letter from Trip. I sit outside and think about you and the things we used to do. But I screwed up bad and got locked up. I can't help but to get mad at you. You're not here for me when I need someone. But I think you might be mad at me because I'm not here. I'm not there for you. If you let me back, I will I'll prove, prove my love, love to you. you. the ghost insistence on revenge. Hamlet wants to prove himself Claudius' guilt before taking action. He started by acting a little crazy, partly to throw everyone off, and partly to be able to justify whatever action he needed to take to find a truth. Claudius recruits some of his old buddies of his, Rose Plants and Goldstein, to spy on him. Hamlet shares with them his unhappiness with the mankind. A troop of actors are giving a performance to celebrate the wedding of the new king and queen. Hamlet isn't ready to take action against his uncles. Claudius yet and Steve's to have one of the actors create a play that replicates the murder of his father. If Claudius freaks out, Hamlet will know that he's killed him. children of the earth. Happy that we are not over happy. Our fortune's cap, we are not the very button. Nor the soles of her shoes. Neither, my lord. Uh, then you live about her waist, or in the middle of her favors? <laughs> her private's weak. In the secret parts of fortune. Most true. She is a strumpet. What news? <laughs> None, my lord, but that the world's grown honest. It is doomsday near, but your news is not true. Let me question you more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? 
<laughs> prison, my lord? <laughs> Denmark's a prison. Then is the world one? A goodly one in which there are many confines, wards, and dungeons. Denmark being one of the worst. <laughs> we think not so, my lord. Well, then tis none for you. For thee is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Why then, your ambition makes it one. Just too narrow for your mind. Oh God, I could be bound in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams? Indeed, are ambitions? For the very substance of ambitions is merely the shadow of a dream. The dream itself is but a shadow. Truly, and I hold the ambition of so airy and light a quality that is but a shadow's shadow. Then are our beggars' bodies and our monarchs and outstretched heroes and the beggars' shadows. Shall we go to the court for, by my fay, I cannot reason? We'll wait upon you. you. No such matter. I will not search you with the rest of my servants, for to speak to you like an ominous man, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Bigger than I am, I am even poor in thanks. But I thank you, and sure, dear friend, my thanks are too dear a half penny. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, come, deal justly with me. Come, come, nay, speak. What should we say, my lord? Anything, but to the purpose. You were sent for, and there's a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to color. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship. Be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. What say you? Nay then, I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for you. I will tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery. In your secrecy to the king and queen, molt no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, foregone all custom of exercise, and indeed, it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof, fettered with golden fire, why, it appears nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights me not, no, nor woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. <laughs> My lord! There was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why then did you laugh then when I said man delights me not? To think, my lord, if you delight not in man, what Linton entertainment the player shall receive from you. We caught at him on the way, and hither, here he is, coming to offer you service. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute to me. <laughs> here are the players. On Mars armor forged the proof he turned. With less remorse than Bryce's bleeding sword, now falls on Priam. But woe, ah, have seen the morbid queen. But if the gods himself see her, then we saw Bryce make malicious sport in mincing with the sword of her husband's limbs. An instant burst of clamor that she made, unless the mortal moved them not at all, would have made milk the burning eyes of heaven. We'll hear a play tomorrow. Dost thou hear me, old friend? Can you play the murder of Gonzago? Aye, oh, my lord. We'll have it tomorrow night. We could, for need, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines, which I would set down and insert into it. Could you not? Aye, oh, my lord. Very well. My good friends, I'll leave you till night. You are welcome at Elsinore. Good, my lord. Aye. So, goodbye to you. Now I am alone. Slave am I. Is not 
monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion. Confess his soul so to his own conceit, that from a working off his visage plain, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect of broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing. For, for Hecuba. Hecuba! What's Hecuba to him? Or he to Hecuba? That he should weep for her. What would he do had he the motives and hues for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and clean the general hair with horrid speech. Make mad the guilty and appall the free. Confound the ignorant and amaze, indeed, the very faculties of eyes and ears. Am, Am I a coward? Who calls me villain? Breaks my tape across, pops off my beard, and blows it in my face. Tweaks me by the nose, give me the lie to throw as deep as to the lungs. Bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous kindness villain. Oh, oh vengeance. vengeance! Why, what an ass am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted by my revenge, by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a cursing like a very drab. Hmm. I've heard that the guilty creates sin and a play have by the very cutting of a scene been struck to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malfections for murder, though it have no tongue or speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks, I'll tempt him to the quick. If he do blanch, I know my course. The spirit I have seen may be a devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape Yea, and perhaps, out of my weakness and melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have, I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play is the thing where I'll catch, I'll catch the, the conscience, conscience of the king. king. enthusiasts have had the ongoing debate over Hamlet's state of mind as the play progresses. Some interpret Hamlet's actions and thoughts as a slow driven madness that was induced by his father's death and seeing the apparitions. Others feel that Hamlet was just putting on an act to mislead his family and the court so that he could have an easier path to getting the answers that he's looking for. Therefore, what exactly is crazy and was Hamlet just that? You decide. But this next piece is called Am I Crazy? It was written and will be performed by me. <laughs> cool. Am I crazy, you ask? Am I in danger? Should I be in Gotham's asylum with the Joker and the Harley Quinn? Am I in danger, you ask, because of my desire for fast motorcycles and big swell waves to surf? Am I crazy, you ask, because of my choices and my crime, and the actions of my unpredictable choices that have not yet come to pass? Did my youth make me crazy for my days as an adult from chasing new ways to get high and new sexual achievements? I have been crazy in love, and I have been crazy with death. And sometimes my dreams have been so real that I thought they were crazy. So, you ask me, Am I crazy? Well, I'll let you know when my other personality gets back. <laughs> when most think of Hamlet, this fabled scene comes to mind. Where, where Hamlet's grief, the trail of his mother, and other circumstances lead him to contemplate suicide. To be or not to be. That is the question whether it is noble, nobler to, in mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by imposing end to die, to sleep, no more. 
And by a sleep, we say to end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, to the consummation, devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, perchance to dream. Ah, ah there's, there's the rub. rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come, when we have shuffled off this mortal coil, must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong? The proud man's contumely. The pangs of despised love? The law's delay? The insolence of office and the spurns that a patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his uh, quietest mate with the bare botkin. Who would Bartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country, from whose born no traveler returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sickly over with the failed cast of thought. The enterprises of great pitch and moment, with this regard, their currents turn awry and, and lose the name of action. Hamlet's soliloquy on suicide, that self-destructive act, which I see is selfish. But not once does Hamlet use the words, the selfish words, I or me, in his to be speech. Don't be surprised. Hamlet speaks not for a man, but all people. Earlier, the prince states, Denmark's a prison. But if we stretch that idea, Hamlet's own body is a prison no less. And perhaps his shadow is the cell that holds his soul. mind, the speech you're about to hear is from Hamlet's shadow, if you can imagine such a thing. If it is real, the dark kid on this ID card, if real the astute gaze, is he real, the second shadow that splits his first, what I see left appears to shadow as he is. Boy, when you see the right, appears to shadow as he being girl. But now, I don't mean to humanize, but this man hid the second shadow. Denials, simple requirements, deny, deny. A day start, a, a, a thirst so shameful, he is aroused and made sick. And he does something. In ten minutes, he does his best with puberty because he finds men attractive. He has parts of a man but is cruelly caged within a body incompatible with truth. Is she that dangerous? The girl, the woman on this ID card? Lost, each so vacuous an eye? Is she that dangerous? The is. The transgender committed to this dangerous institution? And why not? She is where she is. I suspect 
because she is not a victim. When the play is performed in Claudius Caesar's murder of the old king, reenacted, he stops the play and takes off. Hamlet, his suspicions confirmed, follows him. Claudius goes to a confessional and tries to pray for release, to release himself from guilt. Hamlet, seeing but not overhearing, considers killing Claudius but holds off because he doesn't want a Claudius purged from guilt to be able to enter heaven. Oh, my offense is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal of this curse upon it. A brother's murder. Pray can I not. Though inclination be as sharp as will, my stronger guilt defeats my strong intent. And like a man who's double to business bound, I stand where I shall first begin and both neglect. What if this cursed hand was made thicker with itself than with brother's blood on it? Is it no rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? My fault is past. But oh, what form of prayer can serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder? That cannot be. Since I am still possessed of the very effects for which I did the murder. My crown, my own ambition, my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offense? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet what can it? What cannot be repent? Oh, wretched state. Oh, bosom as black as death. Oh, lime soul that struggling to be free and more engaged. Help, angels, make the same. Bow stubborn knees and heart with strings of steel. Be soft as sinners, as the newborn babe. Oh, all may be well. Now, I might do it, Pat. Now he's praying, and now I'll do it. And so he goes to heaven, and so I am revenged. That would be scam. A villain kills my father, and for that, I his sole son, do the same villain send to heaven. Why, this is higher in salary, not revenge. He took my father grossly and full of bread. With all his crimes brought blown, a flash as may. And how his audit stands, who knows, save heaven? But in our circumstance and course of thought, tis heavy with him. And am I then revenged? Taking him in the purging of his soul when he is fit and seasoned for passage? No! No, up, sword, and know thou a more horrid hand. When he is drunk asleep, or in his rage, or on the accessorious pleasures of his bed, a game, a swearing, or about some act that has no relish or salvation in it, then trip him, that his heels may kick at heaven, that his soul may be damned in black as hell whereunto it goes. My mother stays, this physic but prolongs your sickly days. My words fly up. My thoughts remain below. Words without thoughts, never to heaven go. All right, in this next scene, Claudius is convinced that Hamlet knows everything and will try to kill him. He sends Hamlet to England. It gives instructions to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to go with him to make sure Hamlet goes to England, where his death has been arranged. 
However, later, Hamlet returns from England. He avoided death by switching some papers that caused myself and Guildenstern to be killed instead. He and Horatio arrive in a local graveyard and meet the gravedigger, which sends Hamlet into another contemplation of mortality over the skull of his old friend, the court jester York. I have been working here as a boy and a man for 30 years. Well, how long will a man live for it to hear he rot? Ah, oh, faith, it be it not be rotten before he die, as we have many pocky corpses nowadays that will, scarce holding in the lay, will last you some eight or nine years. A tanner will last you nine years. Why he more than another? Sir, his hide is so tanned with his trade. <laughs> he keeps out the water a great while, and the water is a sore decayer of your wholesome dead body. Here's a skull that has lived, lying in the ground some two, twenty and three years. Who, who was it? The wholesome mad fellows it was. Who do you think it was? <laughs> Nay, I know not. A pestilence on him for a mad rogue. He poured a flagon of remish on my head once. <laughs> Same skull, sir, was. Sir York's skull, the king's jester. This? I that. That? Poor York. I knew him, Horatio. A fellow, an infinite jest. The most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, and now, how abhorred in my imagination is it? My gourd rises it. Here hung my imagination it is. Here hung those lips that I have kissed, and now not how oft. Where be your jives now, your gambles, your songs? Your flashes of merriment that were once to set a table of war. Not one now to mock your own grinning, quite chap fallen. Now get to you, my lady's chamber, and tell her, let her paint an inch thick to this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. For thee, Horatio, tell me one thing. What is it, my lord? Dost thou think Alexander looked at this fashion in my earth? Even so. And smelt so? Even so, my lord. Ha! To what basis, use us, that we may return, Horatio? Why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till he finds a stopping a bunghole? <laughs> Twere to consider too curiously to consider so. No faith, not a jot. But to follow him thither with modesty, another in likelihood to lead it as thus. Alexander died, Alexander was buried. Alexander returned to dust, and the dust is earth. We make loam, and why that loam whereto was converted, might they not stop a beer barrel? Imperius Caesar dead, returned to clay, might stop a hole, keep the wind away. All that earth which kept the world in all, should patch a wall, expel the winter's flaw. Laertes and Hamlet were supposed to be resolving their differences in a friendly fencing bout. But Laertes, under Claudius's influence, has poisoned his sword in order to kill Hamlet. Claudius also has a poison jewel that he puts in Hamlet's drink. During the fight, Gertrude drinks Hamlet's poison. Hamlet and Laertes are both wounded with the poison sword. And Hamlet stabs and forces Claudius to drink the remaining poison. Horatio helps Hamlet as he dies. <laughs> Oh, 
My dear, dear Hamlet, the drink, the drink. Oh, oh. I'm poisoned. Villainy, let the doors be locked. Treachery, seek it out. It is there, Hamlet. <laughs> Hamlet, thou art slain. No medicine in the world can do thee good. In thee there is not half an hour's life left. The treacherous instrument is in thy hand, unabated and abandoned. <coughs> the fell practice hath turned itself upon me, though here I lie, never to rise again. Thy mother's poisoned, and I can no more. The king, the king's to blame. The point, and venom too, then venom, do thy work. Treason! 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 Oh, ye defend me, friends! I am but hurt! Oh. 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 Fear, thou incestuous, murderous, damned Dane, drink off this poison! Follow my mother. He <laughs> is justly served. It's a poison tempered by himself. Exchange forgiveness with me on the wild. My fathers and my death are not on me, nor thine on me. Heaven, make thee free of it. I follow thee. I am dead, Horatio. You that look pale and tremble at this chance, there are but mute and or audiences to this act. Had I but time, as this fell sergeant death is stripped in his arrest, oh, I could tell you. But let it be. Horatio, I am dead. Thou livest. Report me in my cause a right to the unsatisfied. Never believe it, as I am more an antique Roman than a day. There's yet some liquor left. Give me the cup. By heaven, I'll have it. Oh, God, Horatio, what a wounded name. Things standing thus unknown. Shall I leave behind me? If thou didst ever hold me in thy heart, absent thee from felicity a while, and in this harsh world draw thy breath in pain to tell my story. Oh, I die, Horatio. The potent poison quite overcrows my spirit. I cannot live to hear the news from England, but I do prophesy the election might on Fortinbras. He has my dying voice. So tell him, with the occurrence more or less, the rest is silence. Ah. Oh. Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince and flight of angels sing thee to thy rest. So now we come to the end of Shakespeare's original work. And we're going to close with a collective piece written by us that is called We Exist Inside. So, as this cage bird sings last so, as this cage bird's last note is sung, I can only ask that you see through my eyes, and that in opening your own, your heart may grow bigger than what you see, so you can be moved to believe. To, to believe. believe. To fight. To, to fight. fight. To help. To, to help. help. We exist inside a tornado of our own creation. We assume they are destruction rather than elation. But where wind persists, something else exists. <laughs> As it delivers, something else amongst us, looking up from our occupation, passing the image of our incarceration. We hit a wall, comforting in our ball, rethinking our navigation. But the question then, to be or not to be, may not be the one. Rather what shall be, will be. 
is the soul.